How many people remember to watch the broadcast on Saturday at 10? Listen, rather, listen. Yeah, we'll be watching. We're praying about streaming, streaming live. But please, please remember to listen. You can't listen on Sundays, but you can listen on Saturdays at 10 a.m., all right? So that's why I have, um, asked Joe for my gadgets and all that stuff. We are um, preparing for the broadcast. All right. So, yes, we're ready. All right. Turn with me, please, in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 through 21. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 through 21. And what we're continuing to do since the conference, we've been talking about a season of refreshing. Not just a weekend of refreshing, but a season of refreshing. And as part of that, today I'm going to talk about um, personal revival. Because in order to stay refreshed, listen, we need to stay revived. Tell your neighbor, in order to stay refreshed, I must stay revived. Hallelujah. So, let's read in the King James. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 through 21. And be not drunk with wine, in which is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is life to those who find it and health to all their flesh. Father, we thank you that we have found your word, and therefore, Father, we believe for life. We believe for rejuvenation. We believe for refreshing. We believe for personal revival as we study your word. Father, we release this time to the authority of the Holy Ghost that he would move sovereignly in our midst, we give you thanks for it, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, now, I've been teaching this on Wednesday nights, and the Lord told me that the whole congregation needs to hear this, so I need to do it again Sunday morning. And... I will continue this in the series because in order for us to fully grasp what is being said here in Ephesians chapter 5 verses 18 through 21, we will need to go back all the way to chapter 4 to, to get the context of what is going on. You see, Paul has a principle and a pattern when he writes. He begins with great doctrinal truths. He teaches us the great doctrines of the faith. And then at, towards the end of his letters, he teaches us how to practically apply what he has taught us. He says, here are the great doctrinal truths. Now here is how you walk them out on a daily basis. And so... That's what's going to be happening. So you may want to be here on Wednesday nights to get in the flow of all of this. I'm going to start today with the outcome and work backwards to see how we arrive at this. Are you with me? Yeah. All right. So let's define the word revival. Let's define the word revival. And by the way, revival is only for the church. It's not for sinners. Amen. 
It's not for people outside the church. Revival is for a dead church. To get revived, in order to be revived, you have to be vibed. Hello? Revival is something that's dying and needs to be resuscitated, need new life. So revival is for the church, and I'm only going to give you one definition, the one that is relevant to what we're trying to accomplish, an awakening in a church or community. Are you with me? Amen. Revival, an awakening in a church or community. And, and we've heard a little bit about that today. We like to stay in our ruts. We like to stay in the same old, same old, doing the same thing the same way every single day. Hello. So we get into routine. You know, last week we talked about Acts chapter 3, the man at the beautiful gate. There was nothing to describe him. He was simply called a certain man that was brought daily and laid at the gate of the temple. He was in a horizontal position, being carried every day to the same place to expect the same old thing. Everybody comes with their pennies and they throw it at him. Every single day. <coughs> the same thing. The same rut. The same routine. Oh, come on, church. We don't want to be in the same rut and the same routine every day. Our God is extravagant. Our God is amazing. Our God is dynamic. There is so much of Him, so much more than what we've been exposed to. And He wants to pour that out and He wants to release that to us. But we must have a capacity to receive and we must have a desire to receive. We can't sit in the same old, same old every day. And that's what happened to that man. Every day he was carried in this horizontal position. People carried him and just deposited him. Amen. Tomorrow the same thing. They picked him up. They took him home. They picked him up again. They deposited him. And I'm telling you, an awakening is about to hit some people today. Amen. Just like that man that morning. Yeah. When they came and got him. They probably got him in a wheelchair van, you know, and, and showed up, and, and, and the attendant goes in, picks him up, brings him out, puts him in the van, drives to the church, drops him off, and maybe give him a little can Amen. that he can shake for people to drop their coins in. Amen. <coughs> this day, he thought everything was going to be the same. Well, listen to me, some of you, when you got up this morning, you thought everything was going to be the same, but I'm telling you, the glory and the presence of the yeah. eternal and everlasting God is about to drop on somebody today, and it's going to be a different time. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, this is not my sermon, but somebody needs to hear this. That's why I'm preaching this right now. And so this man thought he was going to be just like every other time. And Peter and John comes along. And he sees them. And he looks at them with expectation. He perceives. And Peter and John gets up to where he is. And the Bible says they look at him. And the way he looks at them and the way they look at him is the identical word in the Greek. So something collided. When both of their stare, their stares, hello, come on. When both of their stares collided, something dynamic that set off a cataclysmic reaction from the heavenly. Oh, hallelujah. God says they are perceiving. So I need to get ready to make a lightning strike all the way down to the gate of that temple. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, come on, people. Increase your expectation and provoke God, hallelujah, that he will say, come on. Something cataclysmic is about to go down. Right where those people are. Because.
because their stare and my stare have created a reaction. Oh, I know some of you are getting this. Some of you are getting this. And so he looks at them expecting to receive something. That's the operative phrase right there. He was expecting to receive something. He was expecting to receive something. And Peter says to him, the same old few coins that you've been expecting, the same reaction that you've been expecting, few coins in my pocket. He says, I don't have that. I don't have that. But I have the dynamic, life-changing, situation-altering name of the one true and living God, Jesus Christ. That's what I have. I come to release that to you today. That's going to spring you out of that prison that you've been living. And instead of not having a descriptor before your name, you just call that certain man. I am about to change that. You are going to become a leaping man. Because when I'm done, you are going to be walking and leaping and jumping and rejoicing. Because the name of Jesus Christ is the name that's above every name. It's coming to give you new life. Oh, come on. That's revival, people. That's revival. That's revival. It must be individual. It can't be just corporate. It's going to start with each one of us. Oh, that man's life was never the same after that. Nobody had to carry him, deposit him in a rut and leave him and go back and get him. No, he no. shook himself up that day. When the name of Jesus was released, Amen. oh, he got it. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Listen to me. I hear some people say, so when is my time? So when is my time? So when is my time? I can't answer that for you. That's going to be a get down yeah, session yeah. with you and Jesus. Yeah. Oh, come on. People call it a come to Jesus meeting. Yeah. You have to know what that means for you. Yeah. And when you have that come to Jesus meeting with Jesus, yeah. you're going to find out when is your time. Yeah. Glory to God. But I'm telling you something. Begin to live by your revelation and not by your situation. Yes. And God's yes. going to begin yes. Yes. to move on you. Rachel, big things are getting ready to happen for you. I'm telling you, uh, uh, last week, God had a word for Paul. And when I called Paul, and I talked to him about the St. Pete Renaissance, he says, what is that? I said, I don't know. The Lord just gave that to me. I just made that up. I just made that up. It's something for you, Paul, with the skills and the background that you have. You have the ability to create the St. Pete Renaissance. Amen. I'm telling you, that's what God is doing right now. He's releasing knowledge of which injunction to bring us out of where we are so we don't live under the dictates of the economy and the recession. We live by the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ that continues to pour out knowledge of witty inventions. Oh, Sister Isaac, if you think the last and greatest thing has already been invented, like what you talked about at the beginning of the service, no, 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 there's a lot more to come. Amen. Wow. Hallelujah. Yeah. Back in the 30s and 40s, they were saying that they thought Henry Ford had made a mistake. Yeah. Why do you want to invent a car? We have plenty of horses. <laughs> there will never be room for cars. Hello. Amen. I bet he's turning in his grave now and talk about what was I talking about? Yeah. Are you with me here? Amen. They laughed the right brothers to scorn. No, and where would we be today without the airplanes? Right. Come on now. The last thing has not yet been invented. God is pouring out knowledge of witty invention. Yeah. You need to put yourself in a position to receive that. That's revival. Where your spirit is so in tune with the spirit of the living God that you are receiving the revelation that he's given out. And this is where we want to go. Where it says, be not drunk with wine in which is excess, but be filled with the spirit. Speaking to 
yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, Amen. giving thanks always unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Amen. Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. In other words, Paul's alternative. See, many people do this in times like time that we live in. They try to avoid the situation by going home and getting drunk every day. Paul says, I have an alternative for you. He says, the alternative is to be filled with the Spirit. That word fill means to crown. It means to level up a hollow. Okay? It means to finish something. To fulfill something. Where, where there was a deficiency, you want to fill up that deficiency. And that's what he said. Remain filled up with the Holy Spirit. Remain crammed with the Holy Spirit. Don't have a hollow spot in your life, in your heart, where the Holy Ghost is not in full operation. Are you with me here? So, what we find, there are similarities and there are differences between being filled with the Spirit and being filled with wine. Here are a few. In both conditions, the person so intoxicated is under a power outside of himself. In the case of the one filled with wine or other strong drink, he's under the influence of that strong drink. Are you with me here? Yes. And the person filled with the Holy Ghost is under the influence of the new wine of the Holy Ghost. In both cases, the people are fervent and excited. Are you with me? Yes. Have you ever seen a drunk person? Normally they're very quiet and reserved. They don't talk, but when they're drunk, a mile a minute. The mouth is going a mile a minute. Hello. Same is true with the Holy Ghost. When you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you have something to talk about, so your mouth goes a mile a minute. And to this day, people still don't believe when I say I'm a very quiet person. I know, Tom is shaking his head and laughing. I am very quiet when I'm not under the influence of the Holy Spirit. I know, nobody believes that, but it's true. My husband is a talker in the family. I'm the quiet one. I can stay all day and not say a word. Not my husband. He finds me every two seconds and he has to say something. He's a talker. I'm not the talker. I am, I am the quiet one until the day I got filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Because I have something to talk about. So there is a similarity between being drunk with wine and being drunk with the Holy Spirit. In both cases, the person is fervent and excited. Hello? If you're not fervent and excited this morning, is a good indication that some leaking has occurred and you need to be refilled. Hello. Glory to God. Yes. Hallelujah. See, we find that in Acts chapter 2 and verse 13. It was 9 o'clock in the morning on the day of Pentecost and the mockers assembled were mocking. In Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 12, it says, and they were all amazed and were perplexed, saying one to another, what meaneth this? Others mocking said, these are full of new wine. These are drunk. They were seeing the people that had newly been baptized with the Holy Ghost. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunk, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day, that's nine o'clock, but this is that which was spoken through the prophet Joel, it shall
visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Peter said, they are not drunk with new wine, as you suppose, but Joel referred to this way back centuries ago that this day would come, and the spirit of the living God would be released, and you are looking at it right now. Amen. This is that. This is that. They're not drunk with wine, as you suppose. They are drunk with a different kind of wine, Woo! the wine of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. In both cases, have you ever seen a drunk person trying to walk? Come on now. Yes. Yes. The walk is affected. It's the same thing in the Christian life. When you live in the state of being filled with the Holy Ghost, your walk is affected. That is your demeanor, that is your behavior, that is your deportment, that is your manner of life. It is affected. You can't be under the influence of the Holy Ghost and live the same way you've always lived. Something is going to happen. Something is going to be different. Amen? Your friends may start making fun of you, but that's okay. Something is going to change in your walk in your manner of life, in your deportment, in your conduct, something is going to change. Amen. Something is going to change. Amen? Glory to God. So, let me teach here for a little bit that there, what we're talking about today as the filling of the Holy Ghost is different from the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Are you with me? And, and what Paul is speaking about in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 through 21, is not the initial baptism of the Holy Ghost where you first receive that infilling with the initial physical evidence of speaking with other tongues. Okay? That is a literal baptism of the Holy Ghost where you become overwhelmed with the infusion of the Spirit of God into your spirit. If you turn with me, please, to Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, we find being referred to there, Jesus Christ is the baptizer. He is the one who initially baptizes in the Holy Ghost. In Matthew chapter 3 verse 11, this is John the Baptist speaking. He says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you, notice this, with the Holy Ghost and fire. Jesus Christ is the one who baptizes in the Holy Ghost initially, where he tells them in Luke 24, 49, do not go out and start preaching. He says, but sit down. That word tarry literally means to sit down. He said, sit down in Jerusalem until you be endued, until you be clothed upon with the promise of my Father, which I will send upon you. That word, into, it means to fit upon like a garment. When you put on a garment, you make sure it fits on you. He says, don't go anywhere until I have baptized you with the promise of my Father that you will go out and be able to minister effectively. In Luke chapter 3, please turn there very quickly. Luke chapter 3, verse 16, we find the same thing there. John the Baptist speaking, it says, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I'm not worthy to loose. Notice this. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Mark chapter 1 verse 8, we will find Mark saying the very first same thing. 
Mark chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the baptizer. Verse 7 of Mark chapter 1. And preach, saying, There cometh one mightier than I. After me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And we see that in Acts 1.8, he said to them, they were asking about the kingdom. Are you going to restore at this time the kingdom to Israel with the splendor and the majesty and the power that it had under David and Solomon? We have seen that you're the Messiah. You have conquered death. You have risen again. And we believe Amen. that you are the one that should come. And will you at this time set up the kingdom as it was under David and Solomon? That was their question. That was uppermost in their mind. And Jesus said, it's not for you to know. In Acts 1.5, the times or the season that the Father has set in his own power. But you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days from now. And in Acts 1.8, he said, but you shall receive after that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. He said, don't be concerned with when the kingdom is going to be set up. You are going to receive dunamis, dynamic power, and enabling, and mind. You are going to receive that to do what I've commissioned you to do. To go and disciple the nations of the earth. Not just the people, but the nations. He said, you shall receive that power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You will be endued with the enabling that you need to go out and carry out the great commission. But that's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about being filled with the Holy Ghost, not as a one-time baptism, but an ongoing refilling and a continuous process of being refilled and refilled and refilled where you are constantly aware of the presence of the Holy Ghost in your life every single day. Listen to me. This is where many of us get into trouble. We get baptized in the Holy Ghost and we think, yeah, you know, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. All is well, never going to mess up again. No, 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 you are wrong. This is where we need the continuous filling of the Holy Ghost to take us by the hand on a daily basis and walk us through the difficulties of life. So many times we miss that. And this is what we're focusing right now. This is the germ, the essence, the seed of personal revival. Where we know that we cannot walk through this life on our own. We can't do it. That's why Jesus said, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter, the paracletos, the one to take you by the hand who will not only be with you, but he will be in you. He's going to live in you. And he's going to be your guide and your counselor and your instructor and your personal attorney and your life coach. And he's going to take you by the hand to walk with you through every difficult situation in life. Amen. When we go through difficulties, we tend to think the Holy Spirit has left us and we have got to figure this all out. No, no, no. We make that mistake all the time. And I'm not exempt. I could tell you stories, but I'm not going there today. We need the Holy Ghost. We need to be continuously filled. 
continuously filled, continuously filled, knowing that he's with us every step of the way to take us by the hand. Listen to me. Yesterday's filling is not sufficient for today's activities. Are you with me? Yesterday's filling is not sufficient for today's activities. That's why the Apostle Paul says, be ye being filled. Continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Stay filled with the Holy Spirit. The Wies New Testament states it this way, and stop being intoxicated with wine. In which state of intoxication there's profligacy? That simply means with debauchery, bad living. It says, but be constantly, listen to the way he states it, but be constantly controlled by the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, giving thanks always concerning all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to God even the Father, putting yourselves in subjection to one another in the fear of Christ. Amen. In other words, staying filled with the Holy Ghost is God's desire for his church. It's his desire for his body corporately, and it's his desire for the members individually. Each one of us, think of what it would be when we all stay filled with the Holy Ghost and we come to church. It's like everyone coming in with your lighted candle. We create an explosion of light. That's exactly what he's talking about. In, in John 7, 38, he says, out of your belly, out of your innermost being, will flow rivers of living water. And John said, this spake he concerning the Holy Ghost who was not yet given. Jesus was speaking of this ahead of time. He said, that's what I want to give to you, living water flowing out of you, out of your innermost being. And it's interesting here in Ephesians chapter 5, he doesn't give us step-by-step -step instruction of how to be filled with the Holy Ghost. He doesn't tell us. He simply gives us a command. Be ye being filled. Stay filled up. He doesn't tell us how to do it. But listen to me, I have a few suggestions for you from the Word of God. Hallelujah. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, turn there with me, please. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. It says, This then is the message which you have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, <coughs> and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Notice this very key here. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. That word cleanseth is present continuous. That means he keeps on cleansing us. But we must recognize that receiving and believe it. That he keeps on cleansing us from all sin. But let me say something. Yesterday we were talking about knowing the voice of the Holy Spirit. And somebody used the word. I used the illustration of when my husband worked in Boston. We spent a lot of money on airline tickets and telephone calls. But every time he calls the house, I could hear that voice. <laughs> I knew that voice. He never had to identify himself. Are you with me? I knew that voice. We need to know the voice of a spirit. And somebody used the word familiar, and I said, no, that's not a good word. Familiarity breeds contempt. Sometimes we get so familiar that we go, oh, it's just God. 
Oh, it's just the Holy Ghost. Oh, it's just less. Hello. That's familiarity. But we need to so know the voice of the Spirit that it ignites something in us. It ignites something in us. We so know it that we never miss it. Are you with me? Sometimes we're thinking he's going to give us some answer that thunders out of heaven. But he's speaking to us in the still small voice. That we have to pick it out of the cacophony that's going on around us. We have to be so in tune with that voice. And at the same time, not treat it with contemptuous familiarity. Are you with me? Come on. Does that make sense? Do you see the difference here? Amen. Amen. So, if we confess our sins, he cleanses us. He keeps on cleansing us. But we don't go off on a binge of sin saying, okay, when I'm done with all this, I'll ask God to forgive me. Okay? He keeps on cleansing us. He keeps on cleansing us from all sin. Verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So one of the ways we stay filled with the Holy Spirit is not to condone sin. We must confess and forsake. Confess and forsake. Second indication of how we can remain filled with the Holy Spirit is found in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Turn there, please. A very um, well-used passage of Scripture. And if you were here when I did this on Wednesday night, you would see my illustration, but I'm not going to do my illustration today. How many have ever seen that illustration, my illustration of Romans 12, 1 and 2? Oh, come on. You've all seen it. No, oh, not the bag. Uh-uh. No. The laying of the altar? The, the yes. The altar. There you go. The laying on the altar. Where in the Old Testament, it was dead sacrifices. They brought the sacrifice. Somebody killed that sacrifice. Somebody put that sacrifice on the altar. Here, God is saying, I don't want that anymore. I don't want that anymore. Don't bring that to me anymore. That's an abomination. I don't want that. I want you. I want you. Amen. I want you. Don't bring me that dead stuff. I don't want it. I want you. I want you to take your own beautiful self and get up on the altar of your own volition and lay it all down for me. I want you. When I have you, I have all your stuff as well. Good and bad. Issues and all. Bring it on and climb up on the altar, you and all of it. That was my paraphrase. Now let's read it. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God said, I want you, I want total surrender. Surrender every area of your life to my management, my control, and my direction. All the little doors that you have kept locked and won't let me in. He said, open the latch from the inside. Come on. You've locked it on the inside. So I can't get in from the outside. You've got to open it from the inside. And I will gladly and you're not on your own with this. I'm going to help you with the renovation. I'm going to help you with the reconstruction. I'm going to help you with that. I want to help you. It's not burdensome to you. I am here to take you by the hand into each of those little rooms, and I'm going to help you with the stuff that's in there. It's okay. Nobody else can see it, but I see it. You can't hide it from me. So you may as well open the door. I see all of it and I love you anyway. Amen. Amen. I love you anyway. Amen. I love you with all 
the stuff and all the issues, but I want to help you to work through it. Amen? Amen. So he said, don't let the world fit you in its mold that you walk around looking like everybody else. If I wanted you like everybody else, I would have made you like everybody else. But I love diversity. So I make you all different. And what I want is you to be you with me fully in you. Are you with me? Come on, did you catch that? I want you to be you with me fully released in you. So you are a unique, dynamic, spirit-filled, anointed man or woman of God going around and releasing that anointing. Everywhere you go, you create the staring. transformed by the renewing of your mind. Glory to God. Joyce Meyer says, where the mind goes, the man follows. Bishop Jake says, you're going to follow your thinking. So, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, the reconstruction of your mind. Begin to think differently. Amen. Amen. Allow the word of God to reconfigure, reconfigure your computer programs of your mind. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Third indication we have of how we may be filled with the Spirit is Colossians chapter 3 verse 16. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And this involves reading the word, studying the word, memorizing the word, obeying the word. And turn very quickly, please, to Colossians 3.16. And I, I want to show you something there. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. Notice this, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Where did we hear that before? Talk to me, somebody. Where did we hear 